All right, how's everybody doing? Yeah, Super Bowl Sunday, yeah, that's right, coming to the nine so you can get the backyard all prepped up for Super Bowl, get some buffalo dip ready to go, get ready to see Usher get down, right, do a little dance, you know, it's going to be awesome. Yeah, come on, yep, anybody that's visiting is like, what did I just come to? Uh, man, I tell you what, I, I am just every, every time I dig into Hebrews, and hopefully uh, you feel the same uh, as we're kind of working uh, uh, together through Hebrews in our city groups, um, and we're working through it on Sundays, just um, I, I, this, the theme um, during worship even today um, was just, it, it just seemed like that was kind of where we were um, in terms of uh, the supremacy of Jesus. I mean, if you were here last week, we talked a lot about um, how big he is, that he's bigger, that he's better, that he's more than we could possibly imagine. And the author of Hebrews was leaning into the Jewish community and the people that were bailing on the church to reinvigorate them in a time of trouble so that they would understand and know, hey, you're not aligning yourself with just a prophet or somebody that was kind of special and did some neat things and was human, but a little bit extra human, just a little bit better than you. No, he is the expanse of the universe. He, he's the, the author of salvation. Everything was created by him and for him. Uh, and so if you got your Bibles, we're going to dig into Hebrews 2. And I love this transition. It is so helpful um, as we dig in uh, to take, you know, why does it matter that we look at the capacity of who God is? Why do we need to expand uh, who, we, who we think he is? Why do we need to expand um, the idea and our heart's affection on what he has done? You know, what is, the, what is the purpose in that? And what's the danger in not doing that? And that's where we find ourselves in Hebrews chapter 2. We'll come back into Hebrews 1. For those of you that were here last week, like, what about the rest of Hebrews 1? Uh, we'll be in that as well. But we'll launch this morning uh, from Hebrews chapter 2. You know, I was thinking about... Some of the things that I was reading in Hebrews too, and I don't know why it popped to my mind, but several years ago I was on a, a mission trip to Costa Rica. I'd been there, you know, probably ten times at this point to the same place. Six Eight Ministries, who's one of our uh, ministry partners, was headed to Alawalita, which was the only location at the time, and. Uh, we were coming in. Now, I, I flew a lot b before I was in ministry, um, so I'd experienced turbulence, and I'd flown into San Jose in Costa Rica a lot of times and had some turbulence going in. And in the tree, and you don't always have turbulence if you're going to Costa Rica. Don't get nervous. Uh, yeah, some of the people that get killed, like, please don't tell this story. Um, but this particular time was the worst turbulence I'd ever experienced in flying, ever. And again, I flew a lot before I was in ministry for the 10 years of software development and all that. I was on planes all the time. And we were coming in, and it got pretty hairy. We, and you know it's turbulent when, the, like, the, the flight crew starts to look weird. You know, they're like, you know, and they're getting every, they're hurrying, getting everybody down. You know, okay, that's safety precaution. And then you see that one, you know, flight attendant's face, looking at a couple beads of sweat, just looking around like, is this normal? Uh, and if you don't think it's normal, then we sure enough should be a little bit nervous. Uh, and it was like big drops, you know what I mean? When you're in, in a plane, if you've ever flown, and it's, you know, you get those few bumps. I'm talking about like people came up out of their seats, like in the movies. Uh, a couple people got hurt, banging their heads. I mean, it was, an, a lot of people got sick. My mother-in-law, who has an iron stomach, got sick on the plane, and several other people got sick on the plane. She was headed there because she lived there uh, half the time a year. My father-in-law was already there. He was part of 6-8 Ministries back then. Uh, and it, the, the reason I was thinking about it is the guy next to me, uh, who wasn't on our trip, and it, it seemed like he had been, been before and, you know, flown before. He was grabbing the, the seat cushion next to him, which was empty, and the one right here, and he, was look, he looked at me and goes, do these flow? Did she say these flow? <laughs> and, <laughs> and when we got back to the mission compound, I thought we, we all kind of talked about the, uh, you know, the, the whole thing, you know, kind of rehashing the thing and laughing and going, thank God we're alive. And I just remembered that, that moment. I'm like, isn't it funny how we don't listen to the, the thing? You know, she's doing the, you know, exits and all the stuff. And we're out, Woo, listening to whatever we're going to listen to. And then all of a sudden, when do, when do we wish we had? Some turbulence comes and we're like, man, I should have listened to the warning. Right? I should have, I should have, known. we should, where are the exit signs? Did she say the, are we the exit people? What are we supposed to do? I don't know. They told me I sat in the exit row. I wanted more leg room and I got up on the door. What do I do? You know, you start, for, you forget all the stuff and we, we zone out. In fact, you have the, the amount of data that's coming into the human brain currently, 
Like it has changed dramatically. And we, one, of the, one of the effects of that is that we, we don't listen to instructions very well. Like we drop a lot of warnings. Like they don't stay in there. You make 35,000 micro decisions a day. A lot of them are subconscious, like where to look. Um, you know, what's, you know, I'm hungry. What do I do? I'll, I mean, there's, they're micro decisions, but they're decisions nonetheless. Your brain and your brain knows capacity wise at some point it has to stop. So it begins to shed off things and say, okay, you can't fear everything or you won't move. So there's things that we just say, okay, I'm just going to risk it. I'm just going to go in. Like every room you go, you could die pretty much at any moment. Like, I mean, you could go into a room, there's a microbe in there that could kill you. You just don't know about it yet. I mean, there's, but we don't think about it. And the brain sheds all that stuff off. But in our society, we are taking in more than we ever have. So now the things that are in the forefront, not in the subconscious, like flight instructions, we're just like, we've been this, we've been there, done that. We're not going to listen to them. But we realize that we should have when the plane's going down, right? And that's what the author of Hebrews is saying in Hebrews chapter 2 He's, he's coming in and he's giving warning, like right at the very beginning. If you got your Bible, I want to I cover two questions, two things, and then we're going to do communion together. Uh, and I'm excited about today because I feel like this is, as a church, in, in the culture that God's placed us in, in the world that we live in, uh, right here in Jacksonville Beach, in the beaches area, Neptune Beach, Atlantic Beach, Ponte Vedra, where we are, what we're experiencing in our schools, what we're experiencing in our life, the, the current of the culture, this is helpful and practical. It's one of those things that I read and I thought, man, I, I want a lot, I want a, us together. This isn't preacher speak going, hey, y'all need to do this because I do it awesome. This is me being convicted, uh, reading scripture and needing to understand exactly what God is saying through his word. So two questions that we're going to cover. The first one is going to move pretty quickly. We're going to answer it very quickly and it'll be, be pretty obvious. And the second one's a little bit more, have some depth and some teeth to it. So, number one, what are the warnings and commands in this passage? So we're going to pick them out. A little bit of scholastic work in uh, text exegesis. And then the second one, what do we do and how do we do it? So with what the author says, you know, how are we supposed to take this? And, you know, what what are the things that we need to do? We're going to do that kind of together. I thought about separating those, like what to do and how to do. But it's all one thing. It's kind of one swift motion uh, in terms of what those things are. So if you got your Bible, let's start. Verse 1 in chapter 2, it says, We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. So we can begin to answer the the first question pretty quickly in the passage, but I want to, whenever you see a therefore at the beginning and the top, of a book or a chapter, it's alluding to something that was happening before. And it's a good thing that we covered uh, the first portion of Hebrews 1 uh, last week, because part of what we talked about last week is laced into this passage. So therefore, like, pay close attention because of who Christ is, because of what Jesus has done, because he is bigger and he is better and he demands your attention. If you're picking up what I'm laying down in Hebrews uh, chapter 1, verse 10, it says this. It says, he also says, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. Now listen, 11 is important. They, they will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, and you will roll them up like a robe. I mean, I love this because it again talks about the supremacy and the capacity and the size of who Jesus is. That, hey, that the earth that you are enamored with. The things that you fear and that you put in the forefront, they they are all going to pass away, but Jesus will remain. Not only that, he can take everything that you love, everything that you've seen, everything that he has created, he can roll them up and put them in his top drawer. Like he does, it can, when it's worn out, like, hey, I, that he controls everything. And with that capacity to save, that capacity of salvation, that's where the therefore sits in Hebrews chapter 2. So if we take what we talked about last week and the supremacy of Christ, that he breathed out the stars, that he was the active force in creation, that everything that was made that we see, he made it, right? We want to we grab a hold of, that he is bigger, that he is better. But then this passage is going to lead us in the, in the way of salvation. But what's it saying in that therefore? Pay attention, right? So there's, there's a couple of things here. One, what are the warnings and commands in this passage? Pay attention, and don't drift. Pay attention and don't drift. 
Okay, so I think let's break down. Let's look at the two of those words. We're, we're in this first verse. Pay attention. Let's look at attention and let's look at drifting because we are in a culture. I mean, you talk about being relevant. You, I mean, in terms of like there is such a thing as ADD and attention deficit disorder, but we have a society that has ADD partly because of the inundation of information in the world that we live in. I, and I'm not going to sit up here and down the, the, the phone that's in your pocket. But, but together, we need to heed the warning that's right here in Hebrews that's coming to us in 2024 about paying attention to what's most important and not allowing our, our, our image and our perception of who Jesus is to shrink in light of the massive onslaught of the media that comes to our face. So as far as attention, attention, the attention market in our world is the most dominating market on the planet. Like there's no other marketing machine that's bigger than the attention market. And what I mean is you look at social media. The thing that's with you all the time is your phone. It's there. And we think we choose and we make choices about what we want to consume when it comes. Like, hey, I want some relief. I want to relax a little bit. I'm going to look at some Instagram, see what my homies are doing, check things out, you know, see all the Super Bowl memes and see what Taylor Swift and Kelsey are up to. That's what we're going to do. And we feel like we're in control of that, right? We choose what we consume. No. What's happening is somebody, it's not you taking something. They're taking something from you. And I think we're starting to realize what's happening. What they are consuming from you, what they are taking from you, advertisers, and they're doing it to make money, to, to survive. But the, the effect that it's having on society is they're grabbing piece by piece your attention. 60 years ago, a guy named Daniel Borston warned us. He said, we risk, listen, 60 years ago. This blew me away. We risk, he's a philosopher, he says, we risk being the first people in history to have been able to make their illusions so vivid, so persuasive, so realistic that they can live in them. 60 years ago. Imagine if he was here today, he'd be like, wow. Wow. I didn't even, I didn't even, I, that was a grain of sand. That was a shred in my mind that I, that I thought we were headed towards 60 years ago. And right now we're living in that reality. You have what? You've got a theater in your pocket. I mean, that is crazy talk. Like 4K video on your phone. You can curl up, you can watch and put, put headphones in and get like, you know, THX theater sound in your head by yourself a massive amount of consuming of data. And what's interesting is the images that you see, they want all sorts of things from you. They're, they're eliciting things from you. They want your affections. They want your money. They want your, your vote. They want your attention, your outrage, your lust. Every, every tweet brings about expecti expectations in our, in our own heart. And they, they're, they're driving us somewhere how quickly we can get distracted the attention market is a real thing and again you know we can we can talk about technology and it's a wonderful beautiful thing i you know worked on my sermon you know using the internet it's benign in many ways but in the hands of the enemy and certainly in the hands of sinful humans we can turn it into something it can it can push us one direction or the other the question is what direction is it pushing in your life when it comes to attention so the author's saying, hey, let's redirect our attention, okay? And then it says, don't drift. The, the idea of drift, that's that second, second piece to this. And what are the commands? Pay attention. Pay careful attention to not drift away from what you know. Don't drift. Drift is a great term. It's a nautical term. And we know it here. If, you, if you've grown up at the beaches or you've lived here for a long time, you understand drift. And it's, it's a single word that communicates so much. Because drifting, I mean, we, we get it. Like, you go to the beach with your kids, what do you tell them? It's like you set up your umbrella that says, Dad is awesome. And you say, look, you need to look towards the beach. You know, when you go out there and you do the deal, know where we are. Because we don't want to come running on the beach looking for you. Because of what? Because you're going you're gonna to drift. You've ever been out there and you're thinking you did not move? You assume you didn't go and you're like, how did Margaritaville get right here? <laughs> right? I mean, you just don't even know. And you're like, and you look down and you realize how far you've gone. You see what the author's doing? 
you don't even know that you've drifted. Like as we consume, as we're being pulled in by the attention market, as the enemy is putting everything in our face, as the culture is moving swiftly underneath our feet, things that used to be so abnormal have now become normal. Things that we used to say, oh, I I would never watch that, go there, do these things, have become a little bit more palatable in our culture. That's exactly what the author of Hebrews is saying. That is drift. And some days it's worse than others. As a surfer, you try to find the, the peak and sit on the peak and not move off the peak because that's what good waves are. But sometimes you got a nor'easter going, and what do you do? You're like on a hamster wheel. You're moving the whole time. you got to paddle. you got to keep on going. And if you're not in shape, you're going to lose it. You're going to drift. Again, so many things are wound up in that word drift. Because I'm thinking, when I'm thinking about who I am, and who I am in Christ, and where is my affection, and where is my attention, what do I need to do to not drift? What, what, is, what are the things in my life that are going to put an anchor under my feet? I love Hebrews 6.19, one of, the, one of our verses here. It's on our website, or, and we, we stick closely to it. It's why we talk about anchors a lot here. We have this anchor, this hope. How do we, how do we put something under our feet where we know it's not going to move? How, how do we not drift? Because drifting is one of those things that you and I do. We, we need a marker. We need a fixed point. So when we think about paying attention, pay attention. And don't drift from what you know. What, what's he talking about? Well, we got the rest of the passage to, to dig in and look here at the beginning of Hebrews chapter 2. Verse 2, it says, Since the message spoken through the angels was binding every violation and disobedience received its punishment. Now, that sounds weird. I mean, you're trying to, like, where, where are we going from here? We get the drift. We get the pay attention. What's the author talking about? Now, remember, the audience are Hebrews. These are Jews. So they would understand what Scripture says in Deuteronomy, that when Moses came down from the mountain with the law, that it had been given and spoken to him and written for him by angels. I mean, you can go look at a cross-reference from Hebrews to that. If you're doing your Bible study this week and you're getting ready to go in your city group and uh, they weren't at church on Sunday and you want to sound real smart, you can go dig it up. And you'll see that's, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about the law. That The law was the message that... God's, God extends mercy, but God is trying to lead you to life. And, and if you don't head in that direction, the retribution for your sin and the retribution for not being wise is not good stuff, right? Things are going to happen to you as a result. You're going to, you get, for every violation of disobedience, each, there's justice. God is a just God. Now, verse 3 is where he's, the, he's turning. So he's saying that was the old message that you understood. So he's using that as a reference point saying, hey, don't you remember that if you walk away from God, this is, these are, this is kind of what happens. Again, the warning is still in place. How Now, he's going in 3. How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? So he's made the turn into to talking about the gospel. So the old message, and now we've got this great salvation that comes through Jesus. Again, referencing from the therefore chapter 1. We all tracking? Okay, so we've got this great salvation, this salvation which was first announced by the Lord. Now, when we see Lord there, we know from chapter 1 that we're talking about Jesus. It was first announced by the Lord. It was first announced by Jesus saying, this is what was coming. It's coming way different than you thought. You thought king on a throne in Jerusalem. I'm talking to you. I am the king of kings that brings salvation not just to the Jews but to the entire earth. So that is the Lord. This was confirmed to us by those who heard him. So now we've got Jesus spoke at first. Then we've got the witnesses, right? You're going you're to testify, and there's going to be witnesses. You've got the apostles witnessing. You've got the explosion. Look at Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 2. You, know, you start with 120, and then all of a sudden it's 5,000, then it's 25,000. Those are the witnesses. And then verse 4, it says, And God also testifies to it by signs, wonders, various miracles. So people knew that it was true because these guys were walking around and they were doing the things that Jesus was doing. They're like, there is power in the message of salvation. There is power in the blood of Jesus. He heals, he restores, he redeems. He's the only one that can. And people were like, I don't believe. And then they would go and see what God could do and how powerful he was in and through the apostles. And they believed and the message spread. 
So God testifies by signs, wonders, various miracles, and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit distri- distributed according to his will. So the gifts working in the church was the other, other way they would know the message. So what are we, we're paying attention to what? Paying attention and not drifting away from the message and the messenger. From the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his blood, his body, right? And Jesus himself, the one who brought the message, the one who brought the redemption, the one who brought the salvation. The the, the, the author's saying, look at the Old Testament. God was just. You know, people, there was was an adherence to the law. What a shame it would be. As free grace comes to the table that we ignore it and we walk away and we drift away from it and we lose it, that we don't pay attention to it, that it's not the the center of our our heart's affection. Don't drift from the message or the messenger. And you think about where we are in our society. By the sheer volume of the new media in our lives, Christ grows more and more distant from our attention and our affection. You get that? With the onslaught of the media in our lives, and I, am, I, can't, I can't tell you how much I'm speaking to my own soul right now. The onslaught of media in our own lives. How much, and I'm asking myself as I'm asking you, how much has the idea of who Jesus is, his, how supreme he is, how much he loves you, how great his salvation, how much distance is growing with each post, with each reel, with everything that we are pulling in. How do we wage war? Now, I, I can tell you, just throw away your phone. Just get rid of it. <laughs> just, just trash it. Um, but that's not the answer. It really isn't. I mean, I think, I think we've, we've, we've realized that to some degree. Like, it's here, and it's here to stay. I mean, nobody's tossing out. Now, you can. There's a season, I think, for, you know, when we get... Our, our heart attached to something and there's addiction involved, cut it off. Jesus says, get rid of it. But how do we really get to this place? What do we do? That's our second question. We put it up there. What do we do? And how do we do it? Every time I hear how we do it, I think it, this is how we do it. I don't know why. It just pops in my mind. You ever seen the picture of the guy, Howie, how we do it? Uh, he's a good guy. But this is how we do it. It's Friday night. All right, so what do we do and how do we do it? Number one, go get bored. These are, these are points you're going to write down. And you're going to go, what was he talking about? When I say go get bored, okay, the, the idea right here is how do we pay attention? How do we not drift? How do we wage war against what's happening? And this is where I love studying the Bible because we are close-handed with our theology. But the methodology in which we have church, the methodology in which we do music, all those things God said, hey, Make those culturally relevant. The Apostle Paul certainly did. He walked in to the Areopagus and used their own pagan poetry to lead him to Jesus. He used quotes from poetry about Zeus. In him we live and move and have our being. That's what he did. He knew knew how to leverage the culture and their philosophy to lead them to Jesus. So this is the culture. We are in 2024. So we have to wage war against what? Against the onslaught of media. We have to wage war against the people that are taking your attention, robbing you of your attention. So the idea of going and getting bored is we don't ever allow ourselves to get bored, do we? And when I say that, I mean, go outside. Psalm, Psalm 8, Lord, Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You set everything in place, the sun, the moon, the stars. David was on his back. He had no phone. He took in the enormity of who God was. And his breath, he didn't even understand the science behind it. And he allowed his affection to be drawn as he looked up. He took time. He laid there and his attention shifted to the stars and to the things that God created. God created everything. How do we slow down? How do we get outside and stop the onslaught of information that's coming in our world? You know, I had a counselor one time. This was years ago. And I was trying to, I was like, how do I get a hold of you? We were just setting up appointments, and he says, you can, you know, you can email me. Or, and I said, I've got your phone number. Can I just text you? Because I don't have text on my phone. And I said, all right, tell me about that. <laughs> and he said, it's too accessible. Like, it's too immediate. It's, too, it's, it's, it's a demand that I don't know that should ever be there with human beings. And I'm not making some grand pronouncement. I'm just saying what this dude did, and it just made me think. He's just like, I don't do texts. 
He says, because you have to respond to them. And then you have to think about what you respond. And he says, you could be in the middle of the most important thing with your family, with God, with anybody. And our, because of how God's wired us, that little blip or mm, immediately we look down. Is, and why do we look down? Is this more important than what I'm experiencing right now? Like, is, is it more important? And, and it's, it's gotten so crazy. I mean, you can't even, if, if you hit, like, hit a thumbs up for people, they're not even sad. They're like, I can't believe he just thumbs up me. At least he could have responded. I just got a thumbs up. He must be too busy for me. It's a response, you know? I'm going to just start sending K, capital, to everybody, you know, from now on. Oh, apparently that's offensive for those of you that don't know texting etiquette to say K. You can put OK, but not all caps. All cap, that would be bad. Um, but no, no messages, too accessible in the moment. Saying yes to that is saying no to some other huge thing that's happening in front of your face in live and in stereo the world. So go get bored. I've said this before. Go outside. Like from a practical standpoint, put your phone in your drawer at some point and drive away from it. Go to Cradle Creek Preserve here at the beach or somewhere. Just get outside. Go somewhere and sit there. And you know what? For, if you're like me, it's going to take a minute. You're going to have to wait until you get bored. You're going to go, okay, you know, a little twitch is going to happen. You're going to have to figure out, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, it's going to be okay. We live for a long time without these bad boys in our pocket. And what happens when you get bored? And I use that term because, you know, if you're bored, you're boring. That's what my mom always said, you know. You can find something to get a stick, you know, whack the thing. You can do build a fort. Um, if you're bored, you're boring. Get bored. Because all of a sudden what happens over time, this happens in the human body. You can study it. You all, your attention, you know, once you get over the fact that that's not there anymore, you'll notice things. You'll notice the small, the small things will become big. I mean, this sounds like an old bird. You start noticing the birds. Honey, we're going to get a bird watching book. You'll start noticing the birds. You'll start noticing. Yeah, it's, I don't know which philosopher said it, but even a blade of grass has glory to it. Like if you look at it, look at a blade of grass under a microscope. It looks like veins in a human body. It's one of the most extraordinary things to look at. But that's most things. You look at a beetle. You look at a lot of different things, and they are amazing. You take in the awe and the wonder. If we want to know, and go back, going back to chapter 1, if we want to get bigger and better visions of who Christ is and what he's capable of in our lives and every matter of turbulence that might come on our lives, then let's get outside. Let's, let's have, have a moment where we get bored and we commune with the creator of the universe where something changes in our heart because on the practical side, recentering our heart on, on magnitude forces us to ask the question, who made these things? Who could possibly make these things? Only one, something bigger than me, something better than me. Is my media diet enriching my time with Christ or is it eroding it? I mean, I gotta ask that question. But if we... Allow ourselves, it's the beginning of throwing an anchor to the bottom of the ocean and stopping the drift. When we put it in a drawer, when we set time aside, it's called spiritual disciplines. This isn't about earning your salvation. Since past, present, and future, annihilated by the cross of Jesus Christ, we live in freedom. But the enemy is alive, he is real, and he is, he is vying for your attention. And he does it not in a way that we notice. It's a slow drift where all of a sudden we, we sit up and we wonder how in the world do human beings, Americans, spend five and a half hours a day looking at a screen? Again, some of it is just responding to texts and doing work. I get it. But five and a half hours. Imagine if you just didn't do that. Like if you just said, you know what, no more screens. I mean, that's crazy talk, I know. But I mean, you could, you could get two seminary degrees in probably a year. I'm just saying, I mean, that's 30, 30 plus hours a week you get back. I mean, that is crazy. And we, you, do you know how many people I talk to and say, hey, man, what's going on? Man? I'm just busy. I ain't got no time. Yeah, you do. You got five and a half hours every day you could get back. <laughs> I'm talking to myself here. So go get bored. Throw down that anchor. Number two, converse with God. These are, these are not rocket science. And when I say converse with God, I said it that way on purpose because 
there's an all-encompassing thing. We've got prayer. We've got a, a, a converse is a casual relationship, which I, 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 I'm treading lightly because God is holy and you are not. We come with honor and respect, but Hebrews will tell us and the Bible will tell us we get to boldly approach the throne of grace because of what Jesus has done. Doesn't mean he's our homeboy. I think that's ridiculous. But it does mean that we can converse with him. When, when uh, 1 Thessalonians says and talks about praying cease, you know, ceaselessly, I just thought, that's what monks do. That's, I, there's no way I can do that. But when you think about it in conversations with God, if you converse with God, that's all about how do I pray and how do I read the Bible? How am I engaging with God on a regular basis? And I think we, especially if you're new to the faith and you've become a Christian in the last few years or recently, I think sometimes we, we sit around, we listen to somebody pray out loud, and we think, okay, I'm not there yet. I can't, oh God, thank you God for all the things, and you're blaming me. They're quoting scripture and doing all the stuff. I'm talking about just having a conversation with God in the way that you talk to him. You know, I, that's, that's, you talk about re, returning your affections in a certain way. It's a reassuring thing knowing that you can talk to the creator of the universe. You know, when I was in college, I... Uh, I wrote letters to my future wife sitting right there. I know. You're like, wow, he looks younger than that. Um, I wrote letters. My kids think it's so funny and cute. Uh, but we wrote letters to each other. And I couldn't wait to open those letters. Long distance charges were crazy. Y'all remember that? I mean, you just like, my mom would be like, what in the world did you do? I was like, yeah, my ear was sweating by the time we got done talking. Um, so we wrote letters. But what do those do? You, you find out, you, you, you choose your words and you communicate. And what do you do? And you get married and you have date night. You come together. You, you, it's a discipline, but it's wonderful and beautiful. You remember your heart's affection returns to the person that you love. And you look at, a, look at them across the table. And you remember your life together. You recount the things that, that drew you to them. It's the same with God as you converse and you set time aside. In your commute, I know podcasts about Jesus and biblical podcasts are great in your 30-minute, 20-minute commute. But how about turn that off every once in a while and just talk? Like I get out in the water sometimes, and I, I talk to myself a lot, and pe like out loud. And people are like, what? And I'm like, yeah, I don't, but I'm just talking to myself. But now I've, I've made a conscious transition to make those words with God, like invite God into that. Like I talk to myself, so I'm like, yeah, I see somebody, I'm like, yeah, that guy over there's got a, I'll just be talking to God. You got a strange wetsuit on. I don't know what that thing is, the back zip. You know, what you think? Should I go paddle over there and talk to him? Do I have to talk to him today? Do I have to evangelize? Can I just surf today, God? And I'll have crazy conversations, but just keep rolling with it. Like in, inviting him into it. And I'll see, well, I'll come back out. And then, I, then you begin to, to praise God. Like, thank God for waves. Thank you for that wave. That was great. And that guy actually witnessed it so I don't have to lie to anybody. It was really good. <laughs> But a constant conversation in the car. Again, I, in it, put, put Jesus, put the Bible in your ears. Do all those things. That's part of the conversation of hearing how God speaks to you. You're not going to know God's voice unless you study Scripture. So, you know, what does it say? Psalm, I love this. Psalm 119.11. This is about not drifting. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Memorizing Scripture. Hebrews 2.3. We just read it. How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? If we don't get inundated, if we don't understand and know who he is, how he saves, what he's done for us, look at him face to face across the table. You know what I'm saying? Have those moments with God. Conversing with God is an anchor point for us. The word of God is an anchor point for us where we understand and we begin to know who he is. And I might, you might be asking, like, well, I read the Bible and it's weird. Like there's things that don't feel very intimate. Like affection is not a word. When I'm in Leviticus, and some of you are uh, in Exodus right now, and there's parts of Exodus that are weird. Um, but you get it. Well, you get into those passages, and you're like, why? Why? Why does this matter? But it's it's the way that a, like an art history major, when they go to the Louvre, they experience it different than you. They do. Like you're gonna go in there and, and look at things and and be like amazed by the Mona Lisa or, or anything that you see in there. But some of it's an art history major that, you know what, they didn't enjoy a lot of what they studied. Like there was things that they're like, man, this feels like hard work. But they get in the Louvre and they walk around and their breath is taken away in a different way than yours is. Because they've, they've taken the time to get to know. They, they understand. You read Leviticus 
And what's beautiful, there's a passage in Leviticus that's become one of my favorite. And I know that that's like, Derek's so, so holy. He loves Leviticus. No, but it's about worship. Like they, they, they're, they're worshiping God and they're in the, the tabernacle. They're, they're in the tent of meeting. There's two million um, Israelites surrounding all kind of moving in towards the tent. And fire comes from heaven and they all cheer. And it makes me think about us. We're in here, you know, you know, hearing what God has done. And we're, we're shouting. We're, we're praising God. We're lifting our hands. And they, they, it says they lifted their hands. They shouted. They were so excited. God is real. He's for us. He's on our side. And then they realized in a moment, God just shot fire from heaven. And they fell face down. And in, in an instant, you see these amazing two postures of excitement. Because I'm connected to the God of the universe. And he's, we are his people and he's our God. And then all of a sudden they're like, there's a, there's a, a healthy fear and reverence. And Leviticus, and again, I don't know why I'm stuck on Leviticus, but it's, it's about never lose the wonder of God's mercy. And when you read Leviticus, you realize and you see the cross, it's like all of a sudden you, you, you get inundated. It's like walking around the Louvre and you've taken art history. You know God deeper. It's, it's, it's going to your spouse's hometown and getting to know the parents. It's things that maybe aren't the most enjoyable thing, but it, it leads you closer to the person that you love in your heart's affection. So we study the word of God. It's the way that we know his voice. It's the way that when we're navigating life and we're wondering, is the Holy Spirit speaking to me? I'm like, well, that does sound like God. I'm going that way. You have a language now. You know, if you just say, I'm Holy Spirit driven, I don't, I don't read the Bible. Like, how do you know his voice? The whole counsel of his word, it leads us. So we, we don't just talk to God about our frustrations, life, people, ask him things. I feel like sometimes we think prayer is just, you know, petition. There's a lot more to prayer. It's a conversation with the one that saved our soul. How great a salvation the author of Hebrews is talking about. How do we remember? How do we know? Conversations. To go get bored, go outside, converse with God. We need that anchor point. Suddenly, the anchor is getting dug into the sand and we're not drifting. And thirdly, sing. Sing. It's interesting in Scripture that it says to praise His name. But it says over and over again, praise his name with singing. Psalm 47, Psalm 96, praise his name with singing. Praise the king's name with singing. Praise his name. It says it over and over again in Psalm 47. There's a point. Why sing? What is it about singing? And you might think, well, I'm not really, that's not my favorite part of church. It's the singing. Well, give me, just give me a moment and give the word of God a, a moment when we, we talk about the idea of what it means to sing. You know, it says, Psalm 96, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. So that's a collective singing. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his what? His salvation from day to day. Isn't that what the author of Hebrews is talking about? Let's remember our salvation. Let's remember what he's done. Y'all thought the, the old covenant was special that you were his people. Look at the new covenant that was, was crafted from the beginning of time and it was paid for with blood. Don't forget it. How are we going to not forget it? So what does singing do? Why do we sing? Why in the world would we sing? Singing, God knows it, helps us remember, doesn't it? Like it, there's something different about lyrics when they're when they're crafted, like we could say the words to the song Abandon, but it wouldn't be, it, it drives it into a different part of the soul in terms of our memory when we sing it. I was with friends and family the other night and we were just flipping around tunes. I've done this in here before, name that tune. It's crazy what you guys remember, you know? I was, we were singing Summer of 69. Got my first real six string. You know the next line? Oh, the five and dime. You remember it. It's in there. Played it till my fingers bled. There you go. Very, very, very good. Yeah. Jimmy quit. What did Jody do? He, he got married. See? 
you remember. You know, Colossians 3 says that, that we, would, we would sing songs, songs and spiritual songs. And why? That the word of God would dwell in us richly. Not just dwell in us, not just be a, a part of us, but it would dwell richly. God knew it's gonna bury it into our soul. Deuteronomy 31, you know what's crazy is God told Moses, he said, hey, I got a song for you. Write this down. It says that you, you're gonna get to Deuteronomy and you're reading, you're gonna find it, you're gonna Deuteronomy 31. He says, write this down. He says, because your people right now are going through it and then your children's children are gonna go through it go through things again, they're going to sing this song and they're going to remember what I told them and they're going to remember who I am. God's been doing it from the beginning. He wired you this way. He wired you to sing so that you would remember. You would remember who he is. You would remember what he's done. It attaches things to it. So he has us sing one so that we remember. Secondly, it combines doctrine and devotion. Jonathan Edwards says, this is where our affection comes from. It's like all of a sudden, it's different when it's in a song. It changes when it's in a song. And God knew that melodies and harmonies and music would change the very fabric of the way that we remember things. We need all kinds of songs. We talk about it here when I was a worship leader at River City Church. Um, a buddy of mine who was kind of mentored by Tim Hughes and Matt Redmond said, hey, when we worship, we want to lead people all across the gamut of emotion, which is, you know, people are like, well, you're not supposed to be emotional in church. It's, it's emotion. It's about the word. You're gonna, it's all emotionalism over here. We need to be word driven. Are we not supposed to be emotional about the king of the universe that saved our soul? Let's just dry it up and not be emotional about the body and the blood. That is a ridiculous notion. And we want to turn our heart's affection somewhere that's worthwhile. And we get emotional over a lot of other things that don't really matter. It's about our heart's affection. And we would craft set lists of celebration. We, we always want to give the church a song to, to sing and shout and, and praise God for who he is and what he's done. And then we want to have, there's always something in our set list where you don't even have to look at the screen if you've been around for a while. You notice that? Like there's, some, there's something we're all going to know, Right? 